time when the, um, the stand-up album was really born precedes the time when, when Mick left the band, um, which was at, you know, towards the end of 1968, because during the summer of 1968, hot on the heels of recording the, the first Jethro Tull album, This Was, I'd started writing music that was um, a little more eclectic and, and wasn't uh, so rooted in essentially middle-class white boy blues. It was, it was looking at other kinds of influences from classical music and folk music and Asian music. And the first um, airing of some of that material to, to Mick produced a friendly but nonetheless not very committed response because he was out of his comfort zone. Mick, Mick, Mick is a blues guitar player, that's what he started as and that's what he's remained to this day. And um, he was a little uncomfortable with some of the influences and it was, it didn't fall under his fingers as a guitar player. So I, I, I did realise in the, in, the, in the latter months of 68 that we were embarking on music which, which he found difficult. Um, compared to what came after that, he would have found it completely impossible. <laughs> uh, not just difficult, but um, at that point, it, it was a stylistic thing. And, I, and we were going to end up crossing swords o over that because Mick really enjoyed and wanted to carry on doing blues-based material, whereas I rather felt that the musical world was, was, was my rather large oyster and, and one that I you know, wanted to... Uh, indulge those musical fancies in. So um, we became somewhat, as a band, estranged with Mick for other reasons. But um, musically speaking, we, we, would have, we, would have, we were heading, um, heading for an impasse at some point. So yes, the, the, the music of stand-up was indeed quite different. And it, um, it, was a, it wasn't abandoning what I had learnt in the first few months playing in a you know, not particularly good or authentic blues band, but nonetheless a, a group of um, um, quite committed and uh, energetic musicians. So it was just moving on to the next the next stage and trying to bring other other elements in, which were the things that were occurring to me that I wanted to write about. And um, so indeed, it was a it was quite a major step. And I, and for, I always think of the stand up album really being the first real Jethro Tull album on a, on a creative level. You know, the, this, this was, was a, a toe in the water. It was uh, just getting noticed and, and I suppose putting on record, as the title suggested, this was Jethro Tull. This was how we began. This, is, this was the music we played at the Marquee Club in 68 and at the Sunbury Jazz and Blues Festival. But Stand Up was, was literally the, the emergence of a, of a of a broader based and more eclectic Jethro Tull, which is more or less what we remain to this day. At the time that uh, Mick had left the band, or, or we had agreed that he was leaving, I, I um, met up with two or three guitarists. Um, I think the first was the ex-guitarist of the of the nice Davy O list, he popped in, not like an audition, none of them were really auditions so much as just kind of just sitting down, you know, for a chat and a, a little bit of a play. And, um, you know, I met Davy O list and he was a nice enough chap, but again, didn't feel like it was the right, the right mix. Um, we played with Tony Iommi briefly, who uh, came a few weeks later, back to join us uh, on the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, where he mimed the guitar part. Because actually, on that, I'm the only one who's live. The other guys are are uh, miming the parts, and um, uh, and there were one or two others, as I recall. And, and Martin Barr, who turned up, we, we'd seen him playing with a band that had been a support band in some club, I think in Plymouth or Birmingham, I can't remember which, and. Uh, he was playing saxophone and flute and some guitar. But we got chatting and he seemed he was a guy who was learning his craft. Um, he, he, was a, he was a beginner, whereas Mick was a well-established, you know, rooted in a 
you know, an authoritative blue star. Martin was was unformed. He didn't really have a, a, a style yet, and, and so um, the first time Martin met up, he his guitar amp wouldn't work, and it was more or less called to a halt because we had no way to hear him. The second time, I said, look, why don't you come back and just come to my bed sit in Kentish Town and we'll just, you and I, will just sit there and quietly go through something because he was quite nervous. And the uh, second time we, you know, I got the impression that he was um, someone that, you know, could, could learn to do the job because, of course, I routine with him at that meeting some of the, the ideas that, you know, for some new songs, which were... Uh, songs that would eventually be on the stand-up album a couple of months later or three months later, whatever. And uh, and so that seemed to be quite a, a workable relationship. Martin had a few dates to honour with his existing band uh, before he could join us. And I guess technically, I rather think it was Christmas Day, 1968, that the, the, um, the agreement was actually really made for Martin to join the band. And duly in February, whenever it was, Martin did indeed join the band and a couple of months later we were en route to America for our, our first tour in the USA and um, and I think we recorded most of the stand-up album uh, just before we went and uh, by the second US tour in the summer of 69 the, the album had been released and uh, had in fact, as, as I was informed by Joe Cocker over breakfast at Lowe's Midtown Manhattan Hotel, uh, he said, your arm's just gone to number one in the British charts, which was a, a nice, nice little breakfast treat. I don't think he paid for breakfast, but the thought was there. <laughs> well, Martin actually started playing the flute before I ever picked up the instrument because he began playing flute and, and saxophone and guitar was his third instrument, I think, really. But um, on and off during many of the Jethro Tull albums, I played guitar of some sort at some level and there are some things on the stand-up album where I play guitar, not usually electric guitar, I've usually left that to Martin, but there are some tracks here and there that have some electric guitar from me on, one or two on the stand-up album, but uh, I don't recollect Martin playing the flute um, on that album as such. I, I, rather think, I rather think on most of it he played electric guitar and perhaps uh, acoustic guitar on, on one or two of the songs, but but mostly it was um, mostly it was mostly it was Martin, as far as I recall. I don't don't, don't actually recall Martin playing flute. I mean, he's played flute live on stage, um, on and off, in one or two songs over the years. But not. Um, I think he might have played second line. I'll tell you where Martin did play the flute. He played the second line in Bure, and I think he might have possibly played a second line of flute in reasons for waiting. So, so may, may, maybe that was Martin. Um, we'd have to ask him. And, and he'd probably not remember or make it up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I used to um, live in a bed sitter in Kentish Town, and uh, it was a. I was the only musician. The others were all students, and I had to pretend to be a, a, a university student to be allowed by the landlord to to live there. Um, and uh, and one of the students who lived in the bed sit directly below me was an aspiring uh, part-time classical guitar player, and uh, used to practice over and over again, slowly and f haltingly, he would attempt this, this piece of music, which um, he only ever got the first bit of it. Uh, he never went on to the further developments of the tune of the original Bach, J.S. Bach piece. So I just heard this bit over and over again coming up through the floorboards. And when I, when I met Martin, we were talking about music and I, I realised Martin had knew a little bit about classical guitar and music generally, and uh, and I said, "This guy downstairs keeps playing this thing, you know, um, da da dum, de de de, da da dum, da da dum." I said, "Oh, it's a piece by J.S. Bach. I think I've got some music for that somewhere." 
and, and Martin indeed dug out the music and we just discovered this piece called Beret and I you know, learned to kind of play the tune in imitation of the not very good guitar player below me. And, um, and so it, it began life as, uh, um, as a live performance piece, which I think we probably played on our first US tour before or just after recording it, but it was very early on. It was only the second bit of music I ever learned to play on the flute. And, um, and you know, Martin got the chords from some piece of written sheet music, and uh, we did it in a, in a kind of cocktail lounge jazz, sort of slightly spoof way, uh, just having fun with the idea of classical music done in a, a swing way. But, but that wasn't an original statement at all. I mean, it had uh, famously been done by uh, Jack Lussier, who was a French guy who did uh, an album of kind of jazz stuff based on Bach, done in a kind of swingy way. And of course, this is the era of people, you know, there were lots of, lots of people doing, who came from the jazz world, who started looking at classical music, uh, Indian music. Um, people were beginning to stretch out a little bit in the world of jazz and look for something that wasn't just necessarily um, derived from, you know, bebop or whatever they'd grown up learning. Um, so uh, classical music was was fair game, and uh, and this was an example of one of those one of those ideas. Just I suppose in the same way as Dave Brubeck um, didn't pioneer, but made famous in a popular sense uh, the idea of taking um, music in unusual time signatures like take five and then unsquare dance, which was in uh, was in sevens, and and uh, as we did with living in the past. Um, being, as far as I know, the only obviously other top ten piece of music in 5-4 time other than Dave Brubeck's um, um, original Take 5. So, you know, I, I was learning from some of the, the more um, uh, off-piste jazzers, uh, as, just as much as I was learning from classical music and from, from English folk music and the folk revivalists, I suppose, of... Uh, of um, people like Bert Jansch and Roy Harper and John Renburn and so on, I, I was picking up on that sort of stuff. Um, um, and elements of that came into, the, into, the, into some of the songs on Stand Up. So there's this odd mixture of, of jazz, of uh, blues, of folk music, and then um, some elements of Asian music because I was tending to, at that point, start eating a lot of curry <laughs> and of course you heard all this stuff playing in the um, the, the music in the in the local curry house so elements of Indian music and that rather droney kind of wonderful sound which is also found in uh, in, in in Celtic music too you know it's quite often things are very harmonically very simple you know and music that uh, frequently ends up being played on the Scottish or the Irish pipes so there were these, you know, kind of little things going on in my head, all these other influences, which were fun to fool around with. And when you're young and naive and not really a very tutored musician, or not a tutored musician at all, not a very good musician, full stop, then you, you, you do all this with a great sense of excitement and discovery. And, um, and I think that's what, for me, is the, the, the key to the the sort of energy and the both the the physical energy of some of the more rock songs and the, and the intellectual curiosity and the intellectual energy of of the way that we we played around with some um, more um, varied influences which didn't come naturally to the other band members either you know because this, this for them was really kind of new territory and and um, it was it was interesting as a, as, a, as a songwriter and as a musician, to, to try to bring, bring your fellow band members with you on this little, little voyage of discovery, because at that point, um, you know, most people weren't doing things like that. I mean, at least not, not, in, the, not in, the, in the more pop and rock world. It was, um, we were amongst those groups who were pioneering that more eclectic approach, uh, alongside bands like Traffic and, I suppose uh, I can think of a few more if I think about it hard enough, like um, 
uh, King Crimson, um, The Nice, you know, bands who weren't necessarily just blues bands or jazz bands, or they, they were, you know, more eclectic. And so I, I guess Jethro Tull and The Nice and King Crimson and Yes, you know, we're quite different from each other, but we were all um, similar in the sense that we were we were pre-prog bands before you know prog rock took root certainly before it was called prog rock i mean we thought of ourselves as being i think we called we called ourselves progressive without really knowing what it meant but it, it later became progressive rock and short to prog rock and of course became a dirty word because early genesis and elp and and yes were you know, quite quite to the fore of creating in <laughs> some people's minds that prog rock was a was a rather self indulgent and ultimately um, um, you know too big for its own boots kind of music. Um, Jethro Tull were a bit more I don't know what the word is a bit, you know a, a bit more vulgar really a bit more um, a bit more uh, um, slightly more aggressive slightly more off the wall. Perhaps at that point, Jethro Tull had more in common with the bands that were going to be part of the um, the world of music. Some uh, twenty years later, in the Seattle era of bands like Pearl Jam and Nirvana and so on, who um, you know I think were, were a wave of a similar kind, in as much as they were a bit rougher edged, not not too polished. And Jethro Tull indeed was was relatively unpolished. We weren't as good as players. We were nowhere near as good as bands like Yes, who were great musicians and, and very, um, very confident with their instrumental abilities, with their instruments. We, we, we were learning, we were struggling. I'd only been playing the flute for, at that point, for uh, a bit less than a year at the time we recorded, uh, we started work on Stand Up. <laughs> Well, first of all, we played at Sunbury in the summer of 68. It was called the Sunbury, or the National Sunbury Jazz and Blues Festival. I think, rather like the Montreux Jazz Festival today, the word jazz is just synonymous with music full stop, you know, and, and it became, um, it was a little nerve wracking for us, but something of a relief to find that we played at the Newport Jazz Festival. It was part of a series of concerts that were not really, completely jazz uh, and, the, and the, the folks who organized that festival um, I think were beginning rather like Claude Nobbs was in Switzerland to recognize that jazz was jazz but actually if you wanted to fill the house and you wanted to build for the future you needed to be a little broader in your appeal and so George Wine was his name I think um, he um, you know, he had the, the kind of foresight to start bringing in bands from outside strictly the world of jazz or even blues. I think Led Zeppelin also played on a couple of those uh, uh, so-called Newport Jazz Festival shows. But, but for Jethro Tull, it was certainly an, uh, it was, it was an option that was uh, happily taken up to, to play to um, not a typical teen kind of audience, but a, a more varied audience because of quite a lot of... Um, if not senior citizens, at least older jazz fans in the audience. And our very first concerts in America, in fact, were with such as Blood, Sweat and Tears, who were session guys from the New York jazz scene doing their own kind of funky, bluesy, jazzy stuff. And, and we were their, their opening band a couple of times. And, and so we, we, we were, I think to begin with, we were seen as somewhere in the kind of bluesy, jazzy vein. and. Um, and it was definitely a good grounding for Jethro Tull to, to establish itself with a more serious and slightly older audience rather than have been neatly deposited in, a, in, in, the more, in the youth culture of the era, which was kind of just the end of the hippie thing. And, and I was rather anxious that we weren't ever seen as a hippie band, which is why I turned down in the summer of of 1969 when Stand Up had just come out, I, I turned down the offer to go and play at Woodstock because I didn't feel it was the right thing for us. I didn't want to be a band that made its name and f fortune on the 
back of a bunch of naked hippies rolling around in the mud. And that's what 10 years after decided to do. And I think in a way forever, it, it, it stamped them as a certain kind of band at a certain kind of time. And they never really moved on from there. That's 10 years after being our stable mates at the early Chrysalis management agency thing. And um, on the other hand, the, some folks who went there went on to do great stuff. I mean, Joe Cocker was at Woodstock. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, was, I think, was at Woodstock. And there were a few of the, the established, more kind of hippie American West Coast bands at Woodstock. But uh, um, The Who, were The Who at Woodstock? I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who, um, you know, for whom it was a springboard. But I rather feel that Jethro Tull might have gone the way of 10 years after. It might, might have been too much too soon and we would forever have been linked with that one, um, and I think rather pivotal event in the development of music because it marked, just as the Isle of Wight Festival did a year later in the UK, it marked the, the turning point where the whole hippie thing was beginning to turn sour. And uh, there was a nasty political edge, a dissatisfaction, a, quite a physical nasty thing going on as well as the whole hippie thing collapsed in a, in, in, in really an unpleasant mess, uh, most notably at the Isle of Wight Festival, but uh, to some extent, it, you know, happened in America too, at Altamont, for example, where the Stones had a run in with the Hells Angels so-called security people. And, and we saw the edge of that in one or two places when uh, the bikers were around. But uh, um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a funny old summer then. <laughs> 1969 was... Uh, it was a time when uh, we were there with an album that we desperately, or I desperately, didn't want to be associated with what I thought was a, the imminent passing of an era of music and a, an identification with a particularly American West Coast, West Coast subculture of, uh, of that whole hippie thing, which, you know, too much, too much sort of drugs and naked flesh around. I found it all rather childish and irritating and uh, I, just, I just used to like to keep all my clothes on have um, you know have an early bed with a roast beef sandwich and watch not David Letterman he wasn't around then but you know whoever it was Joey Bishop I seem to remember I used to watch Joey Bishop one of the Rat Pack a talk show Could be soon we'll cease to sound slowly upstairs faster down then to revisit stony grounds We used to know a, a lot of people have uh, mentioned to me the uh, the apparent similarity between We Used to Know on the stand-up album and the Eagles Hotel California. And I, I had never really drawn any comparison at all until many, many years later. I mean, many years after Hotel California came out. but. Then, of course, Martin and I did remember that I think it was in 71 or 72, um, the Eagles, before they were rich and famous, I think they just released their very first single called Take It Easy, I think it was called. And they were kind of almost a country band. They were a sort of a, I don't know, kind of pleasant enough, cheerful, funky country sort of band. Uh, um, and they were, they were an opening act for Jethro Tull probably just around the time or just before the Thick as a Brick album in 72. And at that point, I guess we were playing We Used to Know on stage as one of our songs. And, and so it's quite possible that the Eagles, back in their dressing room when they'd come off stage, you know, and they're packing up their guitars and doing whatever, they, they, they may have heard this, you know, permeating through the dressing room walls and, and as is so easily done. You, you pick up on something subconsciously and you, it's not a deliberate act of plagiarism, but uh, the, the chord sequence, I mean the rhythm is different, the melody is different, but it's the progression of the chord and, and some way in which elements of the melody relate to it, that, it, it's, that there, are, there are certainly some similarities. But I would just say I'm, I'm flattered by the fact that a, a much better song than my song was written by a band who, who've uh, gone on to be um, you know, one of the great examples of American popular music of that era, and, and Hotel California is a great tune, and it's a much better job than than I would have made of it. You know, they if if they had indeed taken that chord progression and thought let's 
let's do something with it, then they, they, they made a good job of it, you know, good, good song. But I'm far from being, uh, you know, uh, in any way miffed about it, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very flattered if they, if they took some, something that I came up, because for all I know, I mean, I may have lifted the same chord progression from somebody else without thinking about it or necessarily consciously doing it. And I'm sure I've done that on more than one occasion in my life, but it, it's all too easy to do. It's only 12 notes in the musical scale of you. Keep hitting the piano long enough, you're going to, as they say, you will write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony if you stick at it long enough. Or Hotel California. I think actually during, during our first tour, when, when uh, Terry Ellis came to me and suggested that since we were going to be spending quite a bit of time in the USA trying to you know, see, what, see where we could go with that huge market, um, that uh, we should have a few, you know, song singles or whatever that could be fed into the UK marketplace to, as he put it, keep the pot boiling while we were away. And the first of the songs that I wrote was Living in the Past, and the second of the songs that I wrote was, um, well, was Sweet Dream and a song called Teacher. Um, and, um, and these songs were recorded back home in the UK. Living in the Past was actually recorded in the USA, but, uh, but um, Sweet Dream and Teacher were, were recorded in the UK at Morgan Studios and, um, and became, I mean, they were just simply released as singles, but they got swept up. Uh, uh, certainly, um, Teacher appeared on the, on the album Benefit. Um, and I rather think that Sweet Dream had been released separately as a, as a single prior to that. But, uh, but it was one of those songs, all, all that I actually remember about that one was, was deciding I, w I wanted to have a 12-string guitar thrashing away in the background of it, and I didn't own a 12-string guitar. And I borrowed one or rented one in from a London music store who informed me that, it, that the previous person to rent it had been Peter Green of Fleetwood Mac to play on whatever song he'd used it on. And that was, that was the only thing I kind of remember about the recording session was, oh, Peter, Peter Green's, you know, uh, sweat of his fingers or, you know, on these strings probably and, you know, just a sort of curious thing. <laughs> I think the earliest trips that I'd done abroad um, took me past on the way to the ferry at Esbjerg in Denmark, past a, past a pawn shop where I bought, I said, stop the cab, stop the cab, a mandolin hanging in the window, and I rushed in and bought this cheap mandolin. And it was pretty much a wall hanger, it was really a dreadful instrument, but I, on the way back in the ferry I was sharing a cabin with Mick Abrahams, and I, I remember keeping him awake all night while I was trying different tunings, finding a way to play this thing, and I, and I wrote the song Fat Man on, on the way back on the ferry. And um, subsequently, I guess in London, I'd come across uh, another wall hanger, another not very playable but interesting looking instrument, which was a, was a small bodied, uh, a small balalaika, which has only three strings. And um, um, rather like that guy, what's his name today, C6 Steve. I mean, it, it, uh, the idea of, Carving out a tune with only with only three strings as opposed to six seemed actually in itself quite quite endearing and quite appealing and um, and uh, and I wrote the song um, uh, Jeffrey goes to Leicester Square on the um, on the balalaika which I think I played through a rotating Leslie cabinet um, attached to a Hammond organ but I somehow we managed to plug this thing into a Leslie cabinet and I remember playing the the balalaika <laughs> with the uh, traditional uh, organ sounding speaker cabinet <coughs> which was um, you know it just it was another of those influences it was a sort of a Mediterranean feel I mean it wasn't for me something really authentic but for no particularly good reason it was it was finding a new instrument finding out physically how to play it and how to uh, get something out of it and and I've found throughout my life that from time to time, picking up an instrument that I can't play um, is a very good way to write songs. And, and I often say to people who are, it's like Tony Blair, 
I, I do say to people <laughs> that, um, particularly those that play their instrument really well and have kind of got a bit stuck and, and can't write music, you know, because they've either they're afraid to try. Um, you know, the, the way the entree to writing music is, is often not with the instrument you play already very well, but to put that to one side, try writing music with the instrument you can't play because it will force you to go back to really basic elements and you will find simple things that you would think were rather beneath you on the instrument that you do play well, suddenly they become quite exciting and, and perhaps even challenging to play because you're not familiar with the mechanics or the physicality of playing this instrument that you're completely unfamiliar with. So it's a good way of dragging you back to musical basics is to, is to try playing something you can't, you know, on an instrument you can't play. And, and I, I've often suggested that to folks that um, um, are worried about trying to write music. You know, well-known, experienced and successful musicians, but to, to my knowledge, none of them have ever, ever actually come. They've never sent me an email or phoned me up after saying, yeah, I took your advice, you know, and I've just written this really great song, uh, playing the, um, I don't know, the two-string violin or the um, or the goat herders panpipes or whatever you know it's a, but I mean people like James Galway I've said James just put the flute to one side try playing the guitar you know and but I, I guess I guess people are really afraid they're afraid to try and that's one of the things about being 21 20 whatever years old 21 22 years old is you're not af I, I wasn't afraid to try because the idea of playing a new instrument that I couldn't play, oh, what the hell, you know, I'm going to do it anyway and see what comes out. And, and sometimes what came out was a load of rubbish. I mean, I remember struggling to try and play the violin and even a little bit of trumpet on Thick as a Brick. And the violin is there and the trumpet is even there. But, but you know, I, I learned enough in that brief moment of, uh, of musical bravery to to realize this is not something I was born to do. <laughs> and so um, I think when Barry Barlow took some scissors to my violin bow and, and cut the hairs at the <laughs> I think that was a, a sign from the other band members is, no more violin, please. <laughs> Stand up. The big moment for stand up was the fact that it, it was it was it was its success in the UK, which for me was really important, um, more than its success elsewhere. For, for one reason, which jo is that John Peel, who was a supporter of the band in the first few months and had us you know on his show a couple of times, we, we sort of fell out for reasons that were certainly partly my fault. Um, wrong choice of words, wrong time. Not to him personally, but he wasn't there on the day, but so his producer got a little upset with me and vice versa, and this got back to John Peel, who decided we were, we were now, or I was, um, you know, overstepped the mark and, you know, ungrateful and whatever, whatever, and becoming... He got upset with a few people, actually, John Peel, in those days. He fell out with um, the other folks that he... he, he pioneered in early days, which were um, uh, T-Rex. Fell out with, with, with Mark Bolan, I think, just because... And, and, and he'd, he made it quite clear that he, he got really upset when people that he felt he'd created didn't have time to come and appear on his show anymore and were no longer, you know, as uh, um, kowtowing to, to, to him. He, he took it badly when people moved on and went up in the world and started playing theatres or then arenas or whatever and he, di he didn't take that well and and um, and so we, we'd kind of fallen out and when he first heard us playing the music that was going to be on the Stand Up album, first trying out some of those songs, I, I, I rather think at a club somewhere in Devon um, in the couple of months after Mick had left the band and, and Martin had joined and we were trying some of this new material and he came to me after and said look I just want you to know, I don't like this new stuff. I don't like what you're doing. You know, you should stick to playing the blues. And, and it was, for me, absolutely, deeply sort of heartbreaking that, that you know, John Peel <laughs> didn't like this and, and, you know, was, I mean, really negative about it. And I, I, I was quite upset, you know, I mean, quite personally just really disappointed. I'd hoped that he'd like it. I'd hoped he was going to get over the slight hiccup in our relationship and say, oh, I really like the new stuff. 
I got the, the totally the opposite. And so when, when stand-up went on to become successful, um, for me, it wasn't like I told you so or anything. It was actually more of a sense of relief that, that for once John Peel had been wrong and, the, and, and our British record buyers had been right. You know, that it was actually a well-respected and well-thought-of album. Obviously, it was because it went to number one in the charts. And, and, uh, and I think that probably also rubbed John's nose in a little bit. And, and, and he actually never spoke to me again. I think once might have had a little letter communication. But, but uh, last time I saw him, which is not long before he died, was at, at BBC. And uh, I was on my way in. And he was on his way out. And I'm pretty sure he recognized me um, and just kind of blanked me out and walked past. And I, I was wanting to say, John, John, is he an Emerson? You know, just want to, you know, because I've always spoken fondly about him, and, and particularly in regard to his his help that he gave the band in early years. But um, it uh, it wasn't to be, and uh, sadly, John Peel is not around for me to uh, labour the point <laughs> any longer. You know, so it's uh, it's with personal sadness sometimes that those moments um, have eluded you when you could have, you know stepped off this mortal coil, at least with a sense of having completed the business and said, look, sorry about what happened back then, John. It was my fault, not yours. Or, you know, just, just to make things smooth. And, and I'm, I'm sure he would have, you know, if we'd actually got to talk together, you know, it probably would have been OK. But um, um, he, um, I think he was a, a rather brittle person in some ways. And, um, and stand up clearly was not his cup of tea. Which is odd because he was a great supporter of Captain Beefheart, who shortly after went on to be quite big buddies with, with, with me and the band and, and was on tour with us in America. And, um, and I, I know for a fact that, that Beefheart didn't like John Peel and, and actually gave him a really hard time. And John Peel, I think, desperately wanted to be liked by Captain Beefheart, who kind of gave him the cold shoulder. And so all these things happened. It was, it was a spooky time, you know, people, People that you admired or you wanted to like you very often didn't, and vice versa, people you didn't really care about too much or sometimes want to be your best friend. It's, life's like that, isn't it, in, in all walks of life. But you know, musicians and people in the music business sometimes uh, take it badly if it doesn't go the way they want it to go. As far as I know, the Phoenix House was a charity in New York for uh, uh, drug casualties. And the concert at Carnegie Hall, um, which was then one of the first times, if not the first time, that a, a rock band as such had been allowed to play at the, you know, the prestigious classical venue, Carnegie Hall. And, um, and, and it was indeed a charity concert, which was, uh, had, and in fact, it gave its name to the third Jethro Tell album, Benefit, which, uh, because we discovered that's what the Americans called such things. They called them benefit concerts. It was a term we were rather unfamiliar with, and which gave Terry the idea of calling the third album Benefit. But, of course, got that Carnegie Hall concert was comprised uh, in the main of uh, material which was from the stand-up album. Some of it uh, extrapolated on and developed, you know, in terms of piano solos and drum solos and what have you, but it was, uh, it was a lot of that music and, um, um, and also featured, I think, one or two of the things that were to, to go on the Benefit album also appeared in, live in that uh, concert. Um, so, yes, it was a, a concert that um, I, I listened to actually only this morning, um, you know, on, a, on the reference mix of it. We, I was surprised that we, we still had retained the multi-track tapes to it, so it's, uh, it's uh, remarkably good. The, the Boffins, uh, Peter Muir, EMI and Abbey Road done a great job as usual in saving these really ancient tapes and uh, baking them in the oven and stabilizing them long enough to get them converted to digital medium and then remix them and, uh, and, and recapture amazingly the, the excitement of the occasion, which was, was undeniable. It's pretty rough in terms of performance, but a lot of energy going on. And, and, I, and I think a slight defiance on our part, because we were playing in a rather stuffy classical venue, which actually sounds horrible for amplified music. I, I know this because we played at Carnegie Hall after, I mean, goodness knows how many years after, but um, 30 years after, 35 years after, it was 2006, 
six, uh, I think it was, six or seven, we played two shows at Carnegie Hall and and, um, and uh, not too many people, had, rock bands, had played in there since we played in 1970, so it was, it was still as stuffy as it was and they, they weren't really very nice to us, the people there, because they, you know, they, they, you know, if you've got a couple of sellout shows at Carnegie Hall, it's, it's paying for the, the heating bill, you know, for the next week and, and so, um, I think they were they were pleased to do business, but we we weren't, you know, we were suffered just about uh, um, making a reappearance after all that time. But the first time we played there was, I think, the, the special guest for for no particular reason other than they were in town and some PR person had obviously latched on to them as notable guests to invite to the concert. And because they were not particularly, um, I suppose, famous. Minor, they were rather minor royals. For them, it was good publicity too. So it, it was for no reason other than it was mutually beneficial that the, the Duke and Duchess of Bedford <laughs> appeared at this show, and were wheeled backstage afterwards to uh, uh, looking extremely uncomfortable about the whole thing. The discomfort that seemed to be evident from the Duke and Duchess of Bedford was it was really only matched by my own because this was a not the usual kind of concert environment for us and, and felt a bit stuffy and a bit weird and and these rather supposedly high profile guests were I'm perfectly nice but but it was you could see they weren't particularly impressed with the concert or being there or whatever they, you know we well, I think we, once in a while we all do these things because it's a benefit or a charity concert and we feel we've got to go and, and be seen and do the do the right thing in support of something but um, I rather got the impression they would rather be sitting in British Airways first class on their way home to their palace in the country or whatever <laughs> so it was all a bit amusing but I think that that actually stands for me as, as probably just because it was there because it was Carnegie Hall it was a famous place it wasn't the best show we ever played it wasn't the worst Put it all together in one package of how Jethro Tull was in in 1970, in that period following uh, stand-up and the and the the nature of that eclectic music, having then matured and stretched out into a stage performance and developed into uh, something um, um, rather more uh, brash and explosive in terms of dynamics and energy, and so it, it's a it's a pretty good recording of. Of, um, of how it was. But is Jethro Tull the edgy, not terribly sophisticated band compared to the likes of Genesis? And yes, it's not, it, it's as I say, I always think of it as pre prog. It's got this sort of kind of rough energy about it that, um, that I, I personally, although, you know, obviously punk came along a few years later, but I, I think we saw that again with bands like Nirvana, bands like. Uh, um, the um, uh, Soundgarden and so on, folks who were finding their own kind of rather edgy rock sort of feel with a, you know, with a, a slightly new generation of, of more um, disruptive, less polished music, but less posed, less fashion conscious than the whole punk thing became within weeks of its emergence. It just became a an excuse for a reopening Carnaby Street with a different set of, you know, different haircut, different war paint. <laughs> Rock music for me got back to where it was the right balance between sophistication and raw energy and rough edges. And um, I rather, I rather think that Jethro Tull was kind of in its era what the Seattle sound was 20 years later. And I'll tell you why I think that because. Our sound engineers, once at a concert we played in, just at the time that Pearl Jam became really big and famous, and it was one of the outdoor sheds in the USA, and they were due to play the next night, and our, our crew had gone down to case the joint, check it out, you know, for production values and so on. And um, our sound engineer was, was backstage wandering around and saw this guy coming towards him, clutching a copy of Stand Up. And um, this person came over and said, you work for Jethro Tull? And I said, yeah. He said, um, he said you, you work for Jethro Tull? You, you know Ian Anderson? He said, yeah. He said, well, you tell him that I carry this with me all the time and I listen to it every night before I go on stage. And um, so I said, sure thing, okay. <laughs> it was a rather scary bloke. And he said, who was that? And he said, that's Eddie Vedder, the singer from Pearl Jam. 
<laughs> I thought it was quite a nice story, and um, you know, I'm very flattered if, it, if it's true. <laughs> I'm no reading the thing I said, and he would have made it up, but it's, it's one of those things that probably got embellished a bit. But um, I, li I, I rather like to think that there is that little connection between two eras of slightly kind of rougher, rougher edged, and yet brave new music. Um, and um, I, I hope it's a, a substantially true story. And then, then I feel once again as flattered as I am to think that we played some, some small part in the in the, the Eagles hit Hotel California. Life is full of such uh, amusing little good moments. You want you, you feel you might have just just done that little something to kind of uh, influence somebody else. <laughs>